Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. We're back for another exciting episode of Battles of the American Civil War. After we left you last episode, we left off with the first of the battles, uh, the seven days battles, and we'll have the next two days of those battles coming up for you this uh, episode and not a very good um, showing for old uh, Stonewall Jackson for Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee's like, this is my guy. And then he comes in. I don't know if I was mm. Robert E. Lee, I'd be losing trust in that guy, but uh, mm. you'll see why uh, that happens. Cause Stonewall messes up bad. Both days of these battles here. coming mm. up. Uh, first up, we got the battle of, Beaver Dam Creek, also known as Battle of Mechanicsville or Ellison's Mill. Take your pick, I guess. Took place June 26th in Hanover County, Virginia. It was the first major engagement of the Seven Days Battles, which was during the Peninsula Campaign of uh, McClellan's. Um, it was the start of Confederate General Robert E. Lee's counteroffensive against the Union Army of the Potomac, which uh, at this time, they're sitting right outside the outskirts of Richmond, ready to pounce. And Lee's like, I'm not gonna, today, um, Charlie. I'm not going to ha- ha- let that happen. Not today. After the Battle of Seven Pines, which we covered a couple weeks ago on May 31st and June 1st, McClellan and the Army of the Potomac sat passively on the outskirts of Richmond, like I just said, for almost a month of just sitting. Lee, who was the newly appointed commander of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, devoted this period to reorganizing um, and preparing a counterattack. And that's when he sent for reinforcements. And old Stonewall Jackson arrived on June 25th from the Shenandoah Valley. We know what happened there. He was he was king down there, and then he comes up here. I don't know. Usually how it goes. He was riding high, and then yeah. bam, mm-hmm. brought down to a reality. Well, he brought with him four divisions, his own, which was the Stonewall, Stonewall Brigade, which was now commanded by Brigadier General Charles S. Winder, or Winder, and those of uh, Major General Richard S. Ewell, Brigadier General William H. C. Whiting, and Major General D. H. Hill, all of uh, all of Jackson's guys. And uh, Hill plays a good part in these next two battles. So, yeah, should get a little interesting. Um, with these seven days finally got some action. These next two battles are uh, some some good stuff going on. All right, we'll, so, we'll find out, won't we? We will. The Union Army straddled the rain swollen Chickahominy River. Four of the Army's five corps were arrayed in a semicircular line south of the river. The Fifth Corps, under Brigadier General Porter, was north of the river near Mechanicsville in an L-shaped line running north and south behind Beaver Dam Creek and southeast along the Chickahominy River. General Lee, moved most of his <clears throat> General Lee moved most of his army north of the Chickahominy to attack the Union North flank. That makes sense, right? He left only two divisions under Major General uh, Benjamin Huger and John B. Magruder to face the Union main body. Ooh, wow. This concentrated about 65,000 troops against 30,000, leaving only 25,000 to protect Richmond against the other 60,000 men of the Union. They took a big gamble there. Yes, it was risky. And it required careful execution. But General Lee knew that he could not win a battle of uh, attrition or siege against the Union Army. Yeah, that ain't happening. He's outsmart these mugs. Uh, the Confederate were cavalry under Brigadier General J.E.B. Stewart had reconnoitered Porter's right flank as part of a daring circumnavigation of the entire Union Army from June 12th to the 15th and found it vulnerable. He says, oh. this is where we can attack, boys. Yep. Stewart's forces burned a couple of... Uh, Union supply ships and was able to report much of McClellan's army strength and position to General Lee. McClellan was aware of Jackson's arrival at this time and presence at Ashland Station, but did nothing to reinforce Porter's vulnerable co- core north of the river. Hmm. Why would you? Right. You guys were already scared of uh, Jackson from what he's already done and like, hey, whatever. You ain't kidding. That's crazy stuff there. Uh, Lee's plan called for Jackson to begin the attack on Porter's north flank early on June 26th. Major General A.P. Hill his light division was to advance from Metal Bridge when he heard Jackson's guns clear the Union pickets from Mechanicsville and then move to Beaver Dam Creek. Divisions of Major Generals D.H. Hill and James Longstreet were to pass through Mechanicsville. D.H. Hill to support Jackson and Longstreet to support A.P. Hill. So we got a D.H. Hill and an A.P. Hill. All right. Lee expected Jackson's flanking movement to force Porter to abandon his line behind the creek, and so A.P. Hill and Longstreet would not have to attack Union entrenchments. Oh. South of the Chickahominy, Magruder and Hooger. Were nice. to demonstrate deceiving the four Union Corps on their front. Demonstrate they're like back pretty much like, marching right. back and forth and right. acting like they're bigger it's than like what a, they are. A decoy right. or some shit like that. Okay, so yeah, trying to uh, 
Trying to hit that north flank, man. That's where it's uh, vulnerable, apparently. Uh, I mean, he has to execute this very well, since leaving so little men in over to defend the old rich man. Mm-hmm. Jeez, oh, Pete. Well, General Lee, General Lee's intricate plan went awry immediately. Immediately. Jackson's men fatigued from... I mean, I don't get it. They're walking miles right. and miles every day. We'll go straight into battle. Yep. Jeez. Jackson's men fatigued from the recent campaign and lengthy march ran at least four hours behind schedule. <laughs> By 3 p.m., A.P. Hill grew impatient and began his attack without orders. Jeez, dude, that seems to happen a lot. A lot. And nobody gets reprimanded. None. Hill's division, minus Brigadier General Lawrence O'Brien Branch's brigade, which was placed off to the north to link up with Jackson, entered Mechanicsville and skirmished with George McCall's Union Division, deployed around the town. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so it was just like a, a Western movie you see people right. everywhere. McCall fell back to an easily defensible spot on the opposite side of Beaver Dam Creek. There, the brigades of Brigadier General John F. Reynolds and Brigadier General Truman Seymour from the Union, they dug in. And Brigadier General George J. Meads, oh, look at that. He's going to become a major general here shortly. Yes, sir. Uh, Meads' brigade placed uh, behind him in reserve. Okay. Well, Reynolds' brigade to the north and Seymour's to the south. On Reynolds' right, the divisions of Brigadier General George Morrell and Brigadier General George Sykes formed a semi-soycle. Supporting the roughly 26,000 Union infantrymen were 32 artillery pieces. That's pretty good. There were 14,000 well-entrenched infantry. Oh, well-entrenched. That's even better. They were supported by 32 guns and six batteries. Repulse repeated Confederate attacks with substantial casualties. And they're like, not today, uh-huh. Lee. Well, Jackson and his command arrived late in the afternoon. However, However. unable to find A.P. Hill or D.H. Hill, Jackson did nothing. Right. Although a major battle was raging within airshot. He ordered his troops to make camp for the evening. Right. Hill's 11,000 men, most of them green regiments who had never fired a shot in battle, launched a series of futile attacks over the next few hours. Mm. The brigade of John R. Anderson assaulted the Union uh, right flank with James Archer's uh, and Charles W. Fields' brigades in support. Okay. Maxie Gregg's brigade was held in reserve and did not participate in the battle at all. Okay. Trekked in his troops, John Reynolds gestured at the oncoming mass of Confederates and told a staffer, he said, they're... There they come, like flies on a piece of gingerbread Uh or shit. Right. Uh, The Union artillery and musketry tore enormous gaps in the Confederate lines as they attempted to cross the creek. Of course they did. Jeez, oh, Pete. Mm -hmm. Although Although A.P. Hill had 24 guns with him, he made no attempt to use mass artillery fire to counter the Union gunners. Stupidity. Wow. Instead, sending individual batteries in support of the infantry, most of which were quickly put out of action by enemy shelling. Of course they were. Come on. So stupid. Some of Anderson's men managed to get across the creek and momentarily threatened Reynolds' position. However, he was reinforced by Meade's brigade and two regiments from Morrell's division. The three Confederate brigades were driven back with substantial casualties. Arriving on the field and realizing what had happened, Robert E. Lee hastily summoned Longstreet's and D.H. Hill's divisions. He was like, the hell's going on? Get your asses up there. As Lee surveyed the feudal attacks, Jefferson Davis and the Confederate cabinet rode upon to him. Oh, look at Jefferson Davis. Hell. Davis asked him, General, what is all this army, and what is it doing here? Lee replied sarcastically, I don't know, Mr. President. It's not my army, and this is no place for it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Jeez. Well, meanwhile, William D. Pender's brigade then attacked the Union left flank at Ellerson's Mill, held by Seymour's brigade. Once again, the well-entrenched infantry and massed artillery proved too much for the Confederates, and Pender was forced to retreat. Just then, Roswell Ripley's brigade of D.H. Hill's division arrived on the field and was ordered next to assault the Union left. Okay. Ripley charged head-on into the Union trenchments and suffered the very worst of all, with over 600 casualties, Jeez. the largest percentage of them coming from the 44th Georgia, which lost 335 men and most of its officers oh, out of a total of 514. Wow. Including its colonel, Robert A. Smith, a roughly 65% casualty weight. Jeez. Holy shit. The 1st North Carolina suffered 50% casualties, 133 killed, wounded, or captured and also lost its commander, Colonel Monford Stokes. General Ripley himself survived unscathed, but came within inches of being decapitated by an artillery shell. Dang. Jeez, dude. They were... Well, if I was General Lee, I'd be really pissed right about now. You got to realize that the Union guys are shooting on the ground level. You're, you don't have good shots from the Confederates coming through unless you get headshots. That's, if they, they, I don't understand why they weren't using their artillery. I don't get it. Who knows? I don't get it. Because they're basically, that was like the, uh, that was like the, um, the United States uh, rushing the beach in Normandy. Right. 
Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> not as severe, but yeah, I, Bro, get, but I get what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, geez, oh, Pete. Except for we didn't have thousands and thousands of guys coming in that our uh, Confederates didn't. Had what? A few thousand. A couple thousand, three, and Union had what, 10? Jeez. Hmm. Ripley's other two regiments, the 3rd North Carolina, 48 Georgia, were to the rear of the 1st Carolina and a 44 Georgia. That's North Carolina. Their losses were lighter. Obviously. Union casualties around Ellerson's Mill were small. Only 40 men were either killed or wounded in the 7th Pennsylvania Reserves and the 12th Pennsylvania Reserves, which were defending <clears throat> which were defending the sector of the battlefield. So you got the old Pennsylvania Reserves in there, huh? Usually the reserves don't die first. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, and then you got the 13 Pennsylvania reserves that lost 75 men, the highest total number of any Union outfit. Some 20 years after the battle, D.H. Hill wrote the attacks on Beaver Dam entrenchments on the heights of the Malvern Hill at Gettysburg were all grand, but of exactly the kind of grandeur the South could not afford. Yeah, man, you can't be doing that. As darkness fell, the rest of D.H. Hill's division came up, followed by Longstreet. While on the Union side, George Morrell's division arrived and relieved McCall, whose men were nearly out of ammo. They're like, thank goodness. Well, unfortunately for D.H. Hill, there was not enough daylight remaining to deploy him and Longstreet's divisions, and Jackson did not attack, but his presence near Porter's flank caused McClellan to order Porter to withdraw after dark behind Boatswain Swamp, five miles to the east. So look at even, I guess Jackson's presence is merely enough, right? Right, but I don't know if that's a good thing, because they drew back and now they got a chance right. to... McClellan was, themselves. Right. Well, we'll see. <laughs> McClellan was concerned that the Confederate buildup on his right flank threatened this supply line, right. which was the Richmond and York River Railroad north of Chickahominy, and he decided to shift his base of supply to the James River. He also believed that the demonstrations by Huger and Magruder showed that he was seriously outnumbered. See, well, they did their job, didn't right. they? Right. This was a strategic decision of grave import because it meant that without the railroad to supply his army, he had to abandon his siege of Richmond. Oh. Yep. Okay. Huh. Overall, the battle was a Union victory by any definition, in which the Confederates suffered heavy casualties and achieved none of their specific objectives due to seriously flawed execution of Lee's plan. Yeah, it didn't start out very well. And also, the, his uh, brigadier generals is doing what the hell they want to do. Right. And plus, you got a heavily fatigued freaking uh, Jackson's crew. Just crazy stuff, man. Maybe if they would wait in another day or something. You would think, get some rest. Well, it's not like uh, the Union were attacking. Instead of over 60,000 men crushing the enemy's flank, only five brigades, about 15,000 men, had seen action. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Their losses were 1,484 versus Porter's 361. Lee's staff recalled that he was deeply, bitterly disappointed. Yeah, I bet. He was disappointed by Jackson's performance, but communication broke. But communication breakdowns, poorly written orders from Lee, and bad judgment by most of Lee's other subordinates were also to blame. Yeah, it's a little combination of both. But Jackson was the one he was relying on. He was supposed to be having all his people come in. It's like breaking in a uh, Michael Jordan on crutches and a broken hand. And you're down by 15 with four minutes left in the fourth quarter. I don't think so. It's not like that at all. But it is. No. It was. I don't think so. Huh? No. What? No. Meanwhile, Company F of the 8th Pennsylvania Reserve Regiment, also referred to as to, uh, the Hope Well Rifles from Bedford County, Pennsylvania, were not informed of the orders to retreat after being sent ahead to skirmish. Uh-oh. Oh, they were consequently captured by the Confederates and held as prisoners at both Bell Isle and Castle Thunder. Oh. Despite the Union tactical success, however, it was the start of a strategic debacle and the unraveling of the Peninsula Campaign. Oh. McClellan began to withdraw his army to the southeast and never regained the initiative. Hmm. The next... The next day, the seven days battles continued as Lee attacked Porter once again, this time at the uh, at Gaines Mill, which we have coming up right now. Right. Lee's pissed. Yeah. He got, he's got some stuff to prove here. Sure does. Just took over the uh, Army of the Virginia. And, All right. And then you got Jefferson Davis and J- De- Jefferson Davis and <laughs> Jefferson Davis coming on the battlefield. He's watching, right? And be like, dude, what's going on here? He's like, oh, you tell me. Right. Anyhow, this takes us to the Battle of Gaines Mill. It's also sometimes known as the Battle of the Chickahominy River. I like Gaines Mill better. It's easier to say. (laughs) It took place on June 27, 1862 in Hanover County, Virginia. Uh, Yep, yep, yep. McClellan's Army of the Potomac had pushed to within a few miles of the Confederate capital. Which we know, right? Stalled following the Battle of Seven Pines. Right. Lee wanted to take the initiative, believing that remaining on on the strategic defensive would uh, only 
uh, help the unions out and allow the Confederacy to be worn down, mm-hmm. which they already were. Right. He planned to shift his 90,000-man Confederate army to the north of Richmond and attack McClellan's right flank. Well, he did. Yep. The Confederate cavalry under the command of Major General G.E.B. Stewart. <laughs> or J.E.B. Stewart. Right. Had ridden around McClellan's army, confirming that the flank was open. Yep. Yeah, they were not anchored at the creek nearby and very vulnerable to an attack. Right. Lee planned to use Major General Stonewall Jackson's force, transported by rail. Oh, look at that. Yeah, after the Battle of uh, Beaver Dam Creek, McClellan realized he could not keep Porter's Corps in place with Jackson threatening his flank. Right. He ordered Porter to begin a withdrawal and at the same time decided to change the Army's base of supply from White House on the Pamunkey River to Harrison's Landing on the James River. Okay. This decision was fatal to McClellan's oh. campaign because by abandoning the railroad that led from Pamunkey, he would no longer be able to supply his planned seeds of Richmond with the necessary heavy artillery. So kiss Richmond goodbye for now, people. I think he did that on purpose because he knew he wasn't ready to face Jackson. He was scared. Right. Fucking McClellan needs to be replaced ASAP, dude. He's like, how can I just move out of this own whole territory? Which here? I'm almost sure right after these seven days battles, McClellan's out of here anyways. Several McClellan subordinates urged him to attack the Confederate division of Major General John B. Magruder south of the Chippecana. If, dude, if he would have, it was just Magruder and Huger. Right. He could have, I mean. Right. But he feared the vast numbers of Confederates he believed to be before him and failed to capitalize on overwhelming superiority. Sad. He actually held on that front. There was actually not that many people there. Dude, McClellan is an idiot. Why not send some, uh, I mean, scouts? Right. Right. You got to do something, right? Stupid. Magruder assisted in this ma- misapprehension by ordering frequent noisy movements of small units back and forth and by using groups of slaves with drums to simulate large marching columns. Yep, the old fooling with uh, thinking we're bigger than we are. Hey, man. Furthermore, the Union Army Balloon Corps, which had performed the only aerial observation during the Peninsula Campaign, was now joined by a Confederate competitor. Captain Langdon Cheeves of the South Carolina had constructed a multicolored balloon of dressed silk obtained from Charleston to Savannah. And he sailed it aloft, tethered to a boxcar on the New York Railroad. Or the York Railroad. Right. And it was manned by Major Edward Porter Alexander. All right, so we got some competition in the old uh, aerial spying, huh? Good for that. The appearance of this balloon reinforced McClellan's fear that the Confederates were planted for an offensive against his left flank. Well, uh, they weren't. <laughs> for the second day, the Confederates were able to continue fooling McClellan south of the river by employing minor diversionary attacks to command the attention of 60,000 federal troops. While the heavier action occurred north. Dang, so you got 60 G's over in the south and the east. Or probably a little bit of west. Man, how many do you think it was up north there? Probably. Not as much because it was just Porter. Right. Uh, the order to uh, Porter's Corps came down just before dawn and said, get out of there. And they did not have adequate time to prepare a strong rear guard for the withdrawal, uh-huh. resulting in numerous men from Brigadier General George A. McCall's division being captured by the advancing Confederates. Oh, shit. Porter selected a new defensive line on a plateau behind Boatswain Swamp, just to the southeast of a mill owned by Dr. William F. Gaines. And it was a strong position with two divisions laid out in a semicircle, which was Brigadier General George W. Morrell on the left and Brigadier General George Sykes on the right. A two and two divisions in reserve, which was... Brigadier General George A. McCall and Brigadier General Henry W. Slocum. Okay. The latter on loan to Porter from Brigadier General William B. Franklin's Sixth Corps. Okay. Slocum's division had not crossed the river by the start of the battle, held up by McClellan's concern about an impending attack on Franklin's front. All right. I mean, t- <sighs> McClellan's a fucking moron, dude. Yeah, I don't like it. Lee's offensive plan for 27th of June was similar to that of the preceding day. He pretty much did the same exact thing. He would use AP Hills and Longstreet's divisions to pressure Porter's Corps as it withdrew, while Stonewall Jackson, augmented by D.H. Hill, which is Jackson's brother-in-law, they hit Porter's right in the rear. Mm -hmm. The combined effort of all of Lee's forces was destined to be the largest Confederate attack of the war. But 57,000 men in six divisions. Lee traveled to Walnut Grove Church to meet with Jackson and described the plan. Dang, they did it at a choice. Mm -hmm. The plan called for Jackson to march toward Old Cold Harbor and then south beyond Porter's flank. Unfortunately, Lee made incorrect assumptions about Porter's dis- disposition. How do you do that? I don't get it. You should know exactly where your enemy's at. He assumed that the five corps was, uh, would defend the line of the Poite Creek, somewhat to the west of Porter's actual location. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Wasn't there. Mm-mm. Can't Jeez. do that. Man, how do you not know? Well, well, it's not like they had aerial drones, cameras. 
AP Hills Division uh, had moved across Beaver Dam Creek early in the morning, finding the former Union line lightly defended. As they proceeded eastward and approached Gaines Mill at about the time that D.H. Hills men's were engaged, Porter formally asked McClellan to send Slocum's division across to Ch Chickahominy over Alexander's Bridge to support him. Hill directed the brigades of Maxie, Gregg, and Lawrence O'Brien Branch to spearhead the assault as they had not been engaged at Beaver Dam and were well, well rested. Good for them. Yeah. Greg was held up by skirmishers from Colonel Haram Burdan's 1st U.S. Sharpshooters and the 9th Massachusetts Infantry. By early afternoon, he had run into strong opposition by Porter, deployed along Boat Swain's Creek, and the swampy terrain was a major obstacle against the advance. Usually is. Yeah, you got to love the swamps, right? Mm -hmm. And the little marshy lands and all that good stuff. A particularly bloody engagement occurred as the 1st South Carolina Rifles attacked a Massachusetts battery, but repulsed by Zouab's. Zoavas, Zoavas, Zoavas of the Fifth New York, I think, <laughs> which inflicted fifty-seven percent casualties, seventy-six killed, two twenty-one wounded, and fifty-eight missing. Wow! Uh, and that was on the South Carolinians, the greatest Confederate regimental loss of the day. Branches Brigade, Branches Brigade fared no better, losing four hundred men in two hours of fighting. Jeez! Following behind them, Joseph R. Anderson's brigade launched three assaults on the Union lines without putting a dent in them. Mm. No dents, baby. Jeez. Fields Brigade became bogged down in the swamp, and some of the men in the rear ended up firing into their own comrades. Oh, jeez. Some of Greg's men reached the other side of the creek. None of the rest came close. <sighs> well, instead of pursuing the fleeing enemy, as his orders had directed, A.P. Hill attacked an entrenched using Union position, losing about 2,000 of his 13,200 13, men. Uh, combined with his attacks at Mechanicsville the previous day, the Light Division had lost over a quarter of its men. Jeez. General McClellan was encouraged by the telegrams Porter had sent back to his headquarters a few miles to the rear. He replied, if the enemy are retiring and you are a chaseur, pitch in. Right. Uh, he also told Franklin to cross the river over the Duane Bridge and attack the enemy's flank if he saw the chance. Right. But he was dismayed to hear that the 6th Corps commander had destroyed the bridge for a fair possible enemy attack. Aww. I mean, you got to do what you got to do, though. All right. At the same time, Brigadier General Edwin V. Sumner of the 2nd Corps reported enemy activity in his front. McClellan's optimism was dashed, and he ordered that his headquarters equipment be packed. He said, <laughs> we got to get ready to go, we boys. Gotta go. We got to go. We got to go. We got to move, move, move. Yep. <clears throat> On the Confederate side, General Lee had been an active participant in the failed assault, rallying his troops too close to the front of their comfort. As Longstreet arrived to the southwest of A.P. Hill, he saw the difficulty difficulty of attacking over such terrain and delayed until Stonewall could attack on Hill's left. I mean, it's smart. Uh, well, I don't know if you want to go through that marshy shit. For the second time in seven days, Jackson was late. Mm. A guide from the 4th Virginia Cavalry, Private John Henry Timberlake, had misunderstood Jackson's intent and led him down the wrong road. <laughs> wow. After the counter march, after they counter marched, losing about an hour of time, Jackson's troops found the road to Cold Cold Harbor, obstructed by trees felled by the retreating Union Army, and were harassed by sharpshooters. This delaying their arrival. Yeah. The first of Jackson's command to reach the battlefield was the division of Major General Richard S. Ewell, who was met by Lee's aide, Walter Taylor. And instructed to move into action immediately. He said, you get your asses in there now. I'm telling you right now, uh, old Lee's not too right happy back. if you ain't right. firing your weapons within two minutes ago. Oh, right. <laughs> well, Lee was concerned that Porter would counterattack the weakened troops of AP Hill. So he ordered Longstreet to conduct a diversionary attack to stabilize the lines until Jackson's full command could arrive and attack from the north. Okay. In Longstreet's attack. Brigadier General George E. Pickett's brigade attempted a frontal assault and was beaten back under severe fire with heavy losses. Pickett himself took a bullet to the shoulder, putting him out of action for the rest of the summer. Ooh. Colonel Eppa Hunton of the 8th Virginia assumed command of the brigade. Well, unfortunately for Pickett, old Confederate President Jefferson Davis was among the party witnessing Pickett's failed attempt. Uh, yeah, but that wouldn't be the end of Pickett, though. Obviously, well, <laughs> should have been. He began his attack immediately around 3.30 p.m. Without waiting for his entire division to come online. Well, I mean, when you're told directly to get in battle, you have no choice. General Lee's instructions were to advance along the same axis used by the brigades of Gregg and Branch to maintain the momentum of the attack. He's like, we just got to keep on going. With yep. You guys in, another one just rolling on out, boys. He sent in his Lee brigade. It was Louisianans under Colonel Isaac Seymour, who was commanding Major General Richard Taylor's absence for medical reasons. Oh, he got a medical note. He's like, I got a doctor's <laughs> note. Seymour was relatively inexperienced, and his troops became confused in the woods and bogs of Boatswain Swamp. Mm. 
Their confusion increased when Colonel Seymour was moited by a oh, Union rifle volley. Seymour. Jeez. Seymour! <laughs> Major Rabideau Wheat, the colorful leader of the Louisiana Tigers Battalion, moved to the front to lead the brigade. But he was moited as well oh, wow. as a bullet went straight through his freaking head. Oh. Wow. The Louisiana Brigade withdrew from the battle. Like, right? Yeah, but, old Robidoux's gone, so we're out to. Well, Seymour well, and Robidoux just got moited. Ewell's attack continued with two regiments from the Brigade of Brigadier General Isaac R. Trimble, but they could not advance beyond the swamp, falling with about 20% casualties. Right. Porter was starting to receive reinforcements from Slocum's division, and he brought forward troops to feed into gaps in his line. However, yep. despite telegrams from Porter for more assistance, General McClellan gave no thought to advantage of the counterattack. This right. dude is an idiot, dude. Yeah, he should have kept on rolling. Jeez. He asked his corps commanders south of the river whether they had any troops they could spare. When no one volunteered, which is pretty fucked up, he directed Sumner of the 2nd Corps to send two brigades, about one-tenth of the army, across the river. But because of the distances involved, they would not reach for another three hours. Right, when she knew that. McClellan's a dumb motherfucker, dude. This swamp is just killing... The, the it's a it was supposed to be a an advantage for the south, but the swamp is killing them lately. And they're picking the battles to go across them too. They're like, I don't know why McClellan's like, I don't think we should counterattack. Why you uh Porter's holding him off with his troops? He just got reinforcements. Do something, right? Push their line back. I Jeez, mean, old Pete. When Stonewall Jackson finally reached Old Cold Harbor, weary from the marching and counter marching, he began to arrange his troops and those of D.H. Hill to trap the Federals that he expected to be driven east by Longstreet and A.P. Hill. Well, General Longstreet's there, too. Huh? Let's see if he makes some good decisions. Well, we've only been talking about him for a whole episode so far. Well, it was Jackson that was making dumb decisions, not Longstreet. Why would he? Wasn't the one Jackson that he was? Who's the one that least pissed off at right now? Jackson. It's Jackson, yeah, not Longstreet, but- Longstreet's just he's been there. Yeah, he can't be Longstreet's been with Lee in the uh um peninsula campaign this whole time. Yeah, you can't be mad with Longstreet. Well <laughs> <laughs> he soon received instructions from General Lee that informed him of the current situation. He began to pair his command to assault the main federal line. Faulty staff work prevented his men from moving forward for over an hour. Oh my goodness. While Jackson rode back and forth distractedly, his chaplain and Chief of Staff Major Robert L. Dabney took the initiative to find the divisions of Brigadier Generals uh, William H. C. Whiting and Charles Winder and corrected the garbled instructions they had received. Like, no, so, no, you're supposed to be doing this. So Jackson is completely distracted and don't know what the hell to do, so it takes this other guy to come up and step up in his place. Wow, overrated Jackson. Lee met with Jackson on Telegraph Road and expressed his annoyance at the delay in getting to the battlefield, and he told him, General, I'm glad to see you. And I only wish I could have been with you sooner. Mm. <laughs> He's such a <laughs> mm, sarcastic. All right. Jackson muttered a reply that was inaudible under the noise of the battle. He's probably like, fuck you. <laughs> Lee then asked Jackson if his troops could stand the heavy enemy fire. Jackson says they can't stand anything. They can stand that. Okay, Jackson. I better prove your worth, bud. Lee's assault at 7 p.m. was conducted by 16 brigades, about 32,100 men. Ooh. Porter had about 34,000 to defend the line. But many of these were worn out from the previous attacks. Right. Porter's been getting pounded for two days. Ain't kidding. Um, and command cohesion was hampered by feeding isolated reinforcements into the line to fill gaps. Right. Right. Nevertheless, they had the advantages of good defensible terrain and superiority in, superiority in artillery. Right. But McClellan's like, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to retreat. Stupid. The Confederates were not able to advance simultaneously in a neat battle line over the 2.25 mile front, but rushed forward and were repulsed intermittently in smaller unit actions. On the Confederate left, D.H. Hill sent in his entire division, except for Ripley's brigade, which had been badly mauled in the fight in at Beaver Dam. But they encountered stiff resistance from George Sykes' regulars. Of course they did. I mean, like I said, the terrain is actually hurting uh, the south here because mm-hmm. the north's all set up on the good side. I was and say, they didn't take into account the right. north has every defensible position behind them. Mm-hmm. It'd be a different story if the north was trying to come at them. Right. And then they don't have to go through that shit. Well, the 20th North Carolina succeeded in overrunning a Union battery. Finally, hey. its commander, Colonel Alfred Iverson, who would later gain infamy <laughs> at cross- Gettysburg. He did some crossovers <laughs> on the battlefield. <laughs> AI up in there. <laughs> <It was too. laughs> uh, anyway, he gained uh, infamy at Gettysburg, okay. was wounded in this assault. All right. Meanwhile, the 5th Alabama's commander, Colonel Charles Pugues, 
Uh, it's Piggies. It's Piggies. Piggies. Yeah, so I Colonel Charles Piggies. <laughs> Piggies. He was mortally wounded in the regiment's colors captured by the 5th Maine. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. You got your colors captured? That's a no-no. You can't get your colors captured, man. Jeez. In the center were Brigadier General Alexander Lawton's five Georgia regiments, a large new brigade in the first battle. Uh-oh. Look at that shit. They're getting the first action. They're loving this. Numbering close to 4,000 men. I mean, a good size, too. We got 4,000 guys just waiting to fire their weapons. The brigade was as big as the entire rest of Jackson's division. Right. They pushed forward with the assistance of the Stonewall Brigade, along with Colonel Samuel V. Fulkerson's brigade and Eltsies and Trimbles. And uh, they were both of Ewell's division. Jackson's division had the distinction of containing both the largest and smallest Confederate brigades on the field as his third brigade temporarily commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Richard H. Cunningham, uh, since Brigadier General Ron R. Jones, he was sick. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> John R. Jones, not Ron, John, R. <laughs> Ron, John, Ron Jones, <laughs> John, Ron Jones. <laughs> you said Ron R. Jones, Ron R. Jones. No. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that uh, was numbered to be a little over a thousand men. Yeah. And they were held in reserve. They didn't even participate. And they did not participate in the fighting. I can see why. Right. (laughs) They don't even know if his name's Ron or John. (laughs) Right. During the assault, Arnold Elsey was shot in the head. Oh, no. An injury that permanently removed him from active field command in war. I'm sure it did. He didn't die, though. Uh, Didn't remove from Earth. Uh, (laughs) Colonel James A. Walker, the 13th Virginia assumed command of Elsey's brigade. Samuel Fulkerson was shot in the chest and succumbed to his wound the next day, though. Dang. Colonel Edward T.H. Warren of the 10th Virginia took command of that brigade. Better right was opposed by the most difficult terrain, which was a quarter mile open wheat field that sloped down to Boatswain Swamp, where Porter is. So they're uphill. Right. right. Wow. And then faced two lines of Union defenders on higher ground. Oh, geez. James Longstreet ordered Pickett's brigade back into the action, supported by the brigades of Roger Pryor and Cadmus Wilcox, the other three brigades in the division being held in reserve. Longstreet wrote in his report. He says, I was, in fact, in the position from which the enemy wished us to attack him. Exactly. He's like, yeah, yeah they're like they're like, oh, I hope you come down that hill, you son of a bitch. Right. They're like, we were right where they thought us. Yeah. Jeez. As the sun was starting to go down, William Whiting's divisions achieved the breakthrough on Longstreet's front. Yep. Brigadier General John B. Hood's Texas Brigade moved forward swiftly and aggressively and broke a hole in the line. Four of the nine regimental commanders in Whiting's two brigades were moited or wounded, as well as Captain William Bathis, the, uh, the division's chief of artillery. Oh, no. Pickett's brigade also succeeded in its second assault of the day. Good for him. Confederate breakthroughs. Jefferson on- Davis wasn't there to watch that, though, so now he just still thinks Pickett's right. a moron. <laughs> he goes up to Lee. You better make sure old uh, Jefferson gets this. Right. <laughs> Confederate breakthroughs on their center and the right could not be countered. Yep, fell the apart U- for the Union. The Union line crumbled like three-day-old cookie. Mm-hmm. A total of nine Union regimental commanders were moited or mortally wounded in this battle. Most of the 4th New Jersey, along with its coinal, were surrounded and taken prisoner by Longstreet's division. Yeah. A lieutenant coinal assumed command of the remaining men in the regiment. Sykes regulars conducted a orderly withdrawal from the McGee, from the McGee house to Grapevine Bridge. McGee. <laughs> McGee. I heard it through the Grapevine Bridge. <laughs> McGee. <laughs> okay. Orderly withdrawal, at least. Right. right orderly. The Union Brigades of Brigadier General Thomas F. Meager and William H. French arrived from the Second Corps too late to help, yep. other than as a rear guard for Porter's retreat. Right, that's it. A battalion of the 5th U.S. Cavalry under Captain Charles J. Whiten made a desperate charge against the Texas Brigade, but were forced to surrender after heavy losses. Yeah, surrender, he, too. Right. By 4 a.m. on June 28th, Porter hath withdrawn across the Chickahominy, burning the bridges behind him. Hmm. During the retreat from Gaines Mill, Brigadier General John F. Reynolds well, he was also captured by the Confederates because he was sleeping under a tree. Sleeping on a job, eh? I mean, it was four in the morning, but still, you guys are on an active retreat. Right. Sleeping under a damn tree. Stop the- here for a couple minutes, guys. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I just need Jeez. to rest my eyes. Well, Gaines Mill was an intense battle. Yeah, it sounds like it. The largest of the seven days and the only clear-cut Confederate tactical victory of the Peninsula campaign. That's the whole campaign, boys. Union casualties from the 34,214 engaged were... 6,837, which were 894 killed, 3,107 wounded, 2,836 captured or missing. Well, yeah. Of the 57,018 Confederates, losses were 7,993, 1,483 killed, 
dang, 6,402 wounded, 108 missing or captured, including the loss of three brigade commanders and one general officer. Jeez. Wow. No Union general officers were killed or wounded, and only one brigade commander, Colonel Warren, who remained on the field. And uh, also Major General Henry Diehart, he was also mortally wounded. He was mortally wounded. Since the Confederate assault was conducted against only a small portion of the Union Army, the Army emerged from the battle in relatively good shape overall. Yeah. It was only one-fifth of the Army that got touched. So... It's not like it was a complete loss from McClellan, but he kind of screwed up because he could have pushed forward a little bit. But end of the war. Well, I don't know about that. Lee's victory, which was his first ever of the war, could have been more complete if it were not for the mishaps of old Stonewall Jackson. Oh, wow. Historian Stephen or Stephen W. Sears speculates that it were not if it were not for Jackson's misdirected march and his poor staff work. The major assault that Lee unleashed at seven could have occurred three or four hours earlier. Right. They have more daytime and they might have. It's more damage. Right. This would have put Porter in grave jeopardy without any last minute reinforcements and the cover of darkness. Yes. Right. He quotes Edward Porter Alexander, who was a prominent Confederate artillery officer and post-war historian who says, had Jackson attacked when he first arrived or during AP Hill's attack, we would have had an easy victory comparatively and would have captured most of Porter's command. Right. And it would have been a major blow to the old Union. Mm-hmm. Although McClellan had already planned to shift his supply base to the James River, his defeat unnerved him. That's, that's the problem with Clellan. He he gets so rattled so easily, dude, right. and he just makes stupid decisions. Right. And he decided to abandon his advance on Richmond and begin the retreat of his entire army to the James River. Yeah. He's like, not time for that. Uh, yeah. Gaines Mill and the Union retreat across the Chickahominy was a psychological victory for the Confederacy, signaling that he said, General Lee told Jefferson, he said, Richmond, you're out of danger for now. Luckily. Right. Jeez, old Pete. The only Dude, preserved incompetence as usual on the fucking idiot. Union side. The only preserved portion of the Gaines Mill battlefield for nearly 150 years was 60 acres of the battlefield under National Park Service control around the Watt House. This <laughs> was, sounds like <laughs> sounds like some deep country guy <laughs> going to the Watt House. Going to Watt House. <laughs> going to Watt House. Uh, this tract is only a small fraction of more than 2,000 acres that compromises the battlefield. Comprises. Right. <laughs> compromises. <it. laughs> 2011, two preservation efforts were completed by the Richmond Battlefield Association and the American Battlefield Trust. It's amazing. Uh, the whole center of a lot of the war, Richmond. Right. And it took to 2011 right. to get a lot of it preserved. It's crazy. It's stupid. Jeez. Only for... Seven years later for it all to be torn down. <laughs> the first preservation success. The first preservation successes at Gaines Mills since before World War II. So mm-hmm. they were like, hey, wow. look at this. Uh, this new 285 acre Long Street attack greatly expanded the amount of preserved land at Gaines Mill. They're like, we're going to do the Long Street attack over there. 285 acres of that shit. Must have found a lot of stuff there, though, I bet. I'm sure. That's why they do that. The American Battlefield Trust and his partners had preserved a total of 932 acres of the battlefield through land ac- acquisitions or easements. Good for them. Probably most of them easements. Good for them. Um, yeah. McClellan's a moron, and he better replace pretty damn soon because right. this dude is just making terrible decisions. And now that Lee's in charge, he's getting way overmatched. This dude is too nervy. Anytime anything happens, he's... Oh, my gosh. Did you hear those drums across the river? They must have 100,000 men. Let's retreat. Right. Uh, abandon his whole damn um, siege to Richmond. Just, I mean, this dude's a moron. Dude. And if Stonewall Jackson's shit was uh, actually fresh and ready to go, it would have been totally different. And he's not a moron. Hey, I hear a battle uh, uh, breaking out right. within earshot. But hey, man, make your camps. <laughs> oh, they just march for thousands uh, of miles. Who gives a shit? I'm tired. Who knows? We don't know that. Could have taken the train. They're weary. And I don't know. Just what has happened time and time. Time and time again. We've seen um, ignorance on both sides and just people are dumb, dude. Just I don't understand how they can be. We don't know how many men are over here. We don't know what they're doing over here. I mean, the Union is so lucky in the beginning of the war that the Confederates didn't have the weaponry and uh, the training of the men like they did in the beginning. We talk about in the beginning, the Confederates were whooping ass. Yeah, they could whooped even more if they would have had the weaponry and the training. A lot of times it was retreating because they had uh, single fired little muskets. They're all single fired. 
Well, we just seen last a lot of them didn't the even have the rifles. Yeah, those one guys were only having single shot pistols though. Right. So they're still not having or they're having shotguns. Like what the fuck is a shotgun? A lot of them do? didn't have shoes. A lot of them didn't have this. Well, either or that was just three of the seven days of battle. We got four more, obviously, coming up. Um after this one, we got the battles of Garnets and Golden's Farm, uh Savage Station, Glendale and White Oak Swamp, and Malvern Hill. I don't know how many we'll have next week, but at least two. Probably all of those because it looks like the major. Yeah. Well, the major one done. we just we just uh, covered them, so they might just be little guys. But yeah, we'll probably finish up with them, and uh, that'll bring us one step closer to uh, second and one break. And uh, pretty much, we're fighting in the same place, the Chickahominy. Yep. This whole time, and the York River. Yep. And uh, McClellan's looks like he's an idiot tomorrow. <laughs> so we'll have that next <sighs> week. In the meantime, go check out Battles of the American. <laughs> You're already here. Go check out uh, Outlaws and Gunslingers, where this week's episode is all about the 2007. You want to talk about some crazy shit of people not knowing what they're doing. The 2017 Las Vegas um, Mandalay Bay shooting, right. which a bun- bunch of... Uh, questionable and messed up stuff's happening there and Tid. we break into some conspiracies surrounding it and uh the background the incident itself obviously and the aftermath and pushing for gun rights and all that stuff so go check that out outlaws and gunslingers also this week in sports history where we're just about wrapping up all of the world series stuff and getting into the rest of hockey nba football all starting up so we got a lot of uh Good stats coming up down the line, and you can find that on the Bang Dang Network along with the show that you're listening to now. So go check us out. We'll be back next week for the rest of the seven days battles. We'll see you then. We're the Mouth of Michiganders with Bang Dang.